turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Leviticus chapter 2. Leviticus chapter 2. Leviticus chapter 2, this is the word of God. And when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it, and put frankincense thereon. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. And he shall take thereout his handful of the flour thereof, and of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. And a priest shall burn a memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. And if thou, shalt, and if thou bring an oblation of meat offering, bacon in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. And if thy oblation be a meat offering, bake it in a pan, it shall be a fine flour, unleavened, mingled, mingled with oil. Thou shalt part it in pieces and pour oil thereon. It is a meat offering. And if thy, thy oblation be a meat offering, bake it in a frying pan, it shall be made a fine flour with oil. And thou shalt bring the meat offering that is made of these things unto the Lord. And when it is presented unto the priest, he shall bring it unto the altar. And the priest shall take from the meat offering a memorial thereof, and shall burn it upon the altar. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And that which is left of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. No meat offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. For ye shall burn no leaven, nor any honey, in any offering of the Lord made by fire. As for the oblation of the firstfruits, ye shall offer them unto the Lord, but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. And every oblation of thy meat offering shall thou season with salt, neither shalt thou suffer the salt, of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. And if thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits unto the Lord, thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruits green ears of corn dried by the fire, even corn beaten out of full ears. And thou shalt put oil upon it and lay frankincense thereon. It is a meat offering. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it, part of the beaten corn thereof, and part of the, the, oil, the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. As we read Leviticus 2, did you hear the gospel? Did you see Jesus Christ. My goal today is to show both from Leviticus 2. Last week we concluded the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. And as I mentioned before we proceed to the next chapter, I'm going to do a mini-series on the sacrifices as given in the book of Leviticus. Last time I preached this, uh, chapter 1, we considered the nature of the book of Leviticus. We looked at the sacrifices overall that were commanded. And then I exposited the first chapter, in particular the burnt offering, and how it demonstrates and puts forward our Lord Jesus Christ as the one ultimately personified in the sacrifice. We saw last time from Leviticus 1. We saw Jesus Christ. We saw the gospel in picture form, in shadow.
I also demonstrated that the burnt offering was the most common of all sacrifices for one sin. And how it was not only offered in the morning, but also in the evening. The concept of the morning and evening sacrifice comes from the burnt offering. It is, the burnt offering is the sacrifice most often mentioned in the book of Psalms, which we sang earlier in Psalm 51. It was the sacrifice that was offered by both men and women, where they, not the priests, where the offer, whether it was a male or female, butchered, slaughtered the sacrifice. Where they placed their hands, they pressed their hands on the head of the sacrifice and then cut the throat of the animal or wrung the neck of the bird. We saw how it is the priest who then takes the blood and offers it upon the altar. And then the animal is consumed by fire. A very visceral demonstration of God consuming our sin. And where another dies as a substitute in our place. Again, a type, shadow of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who became our substitutionary atonement. In other words, he died in our place. He's the substitute. The only way for the wrath of God to be appeased is by the shedding of blood. And in particular, only by the blood of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. In order for anyone, any one of you, any human being in existence, to be found acceptable in the presence of God is to have their sins atoned or purged. And the only way for your sins to be purged or atoned is for another to die in your place. Because you are a sinner. You are full of blemishes. You are full of infirmities. And therefore, you are unacceptable in yourselves before God. You have imperfections. And so nothing you do, no acts of good works, nothing you do can be offered up to God as acceptable to appease his wrath that abides upon you. No amount, no amount of good works can outweigh in the scale the wickedness of your life. This means your sins must be purged by another person. One who is perfect, without blemish, without any infirmities. That's what the burnt offering represented. Say, give me an animal without blemish, without imperfections. And that person, that only, only one person that could meet these requirements is Jesus Christ. Him alone. Not, in, not any other person, not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Shiva, not anyone, not me, not you, Christ alone can purge your sins. God, therefore, calls everyone, everywhere to repent of their sins and believe on him for their salvation to believe on the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross and to repent of their sins. That is the only way of salvation. And that is what the burnt offering points to. And in Christ, and only in Jesus Christ, with his blood splattered on you, does the wrath of God pass over you. And this is the truth that is being taught here in Leviticus. This is the foundation, that justification is in Christ. So now we come to Leviticus 2, to the meat offering. 
Now, it's called a meat offering in the King James. All other translations call it a grain offering. And so if you're reading and you see grain offering, that's a perfect translation for it. Here in the King James, meat just means food in general. You know, give us our meat and drink. Just means food. The Hebrew underlying this word principally means a gift, a tribute, an offering, or an oblation in the form of a grain or a cereal. And so this is the sacrifice of the grain offering. And the context of the chapter is clear. What is meant, that what is meant here is grain, a grain offering. This is the type of sacrifice being commanded here. And notice, once again, as I explained the last time we looked at Leviticus 1, it is God that's commanding this. God is the one that says, this is what you must do. And he makes it clear what the ingredients of the sacrifice are to contain. Fine flour, olive oil, and frankincense. Now, when you read this in passing, you may think fine flour, olive oil, and frankincense, and not give it another thought. But all these are pictures of the gospel. All these are pictures that are found throughout the New Testament. And they, they find their foundation here in Leviticus too. We are taught here that the one who offers a sacrifice, be it a man or a woman, is to cook it thoroughly and then to bring it to the priests, not to the Levites, but to the priests. Last time we saw there's a distinction. Now look at verse 2. What does it say? You'll bring it to, the, to Aaron's sons, the priest, and he, the priest, shall take thereout a handful of the flour thereof and the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor or aroma unto the Lord. Do you see what the priest does with the grain offering? He grabs a handful, large amount of the cakes baked or cooked, and whatever his hand is able to grasp is called a memorial to be burned on the altar as an offering of fire, which then wafts up into the heavenly places as a sweet savor or aroma unto the Lord. And if you have ever read the book of Revelation, you should see the connections here. Because, and I mentioned this before, to understand the imagery of the book of Revelation, you have to understand that everything about the tabernacle is explained in the book of Exodus and the sacrifices as explained in Leviticus. And what is left over is given to the priests as their portion and substance to live from. And notice that the substance is declared to be most holy, meaning one of the holiest of portions of all the offering. And in the following verses, the way it is offered is broken down in, the method, I mean, in its method of cooking according to one's financial means. See, these sacrifices were not meant just to be offered up by the rich, but even by the most poor. But before I get into that, I want you to see the many gospel pictures in these first few verses to see how they apply to you today. The grain offering is a glorious picture of the gospel and our status in Jesus Christ as believers. You see, the grain offering represents the offerer's entire person and possession or his properties being offered up, apart for the whole. The meat offering represents his giving to God all that he is and all that he owns. The sacrifice is in part 
a commitment to God saying that all my being, all who I am, and all of my possessions, such as they are, are yours, O Lord, to do as you please. And I stand ready to surrender my all to you. Whereas the burnt offering me meant the purging of sin, as well as the redemption or being bought from the cruel master of sin, Satan, where through the atonement, he who purchases us is Jesus Christ, his blood being the currency that purchases us. The meat offering, which usually comes after the burnt offering, is, a communicate, is us communicating that now that we have been purged of our sins, we belong to you. Everything about us, everything that belongs to us is yours because you have purchased us. We have been bought by the blood of Christ. The grain offering, the meat offering, is the saint recognizing that even though I'm offering this small portion, it represents my wholehearted commitment to Christ. That everything I own belongs to him. Brethren, what is being communicated from both of these sacrifices, and I can't emphasize this enough, because, you know, we live in a day and age where the Christian church is fractured. There are teachings out there to say that the Old Testament has nothing to do with the church today. They'll, they despise these books of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. They say these, this has nothing to do with us. That happens today. And they fail to see that the gospel is here in picture form. They fail to see that these are the words of Jesus Christ. And have everything, it has a lot to teach us, everything to do with the Christian life. You see, the burnt offering and the grain offering are communicating this. You are a sinner. And your sins are reserved for you to be cast into hell unless you can pay for your sins. And because we are unable to pay the penalty that our sins have accumulated, another who is innocent must pay for them and die in our place. Our sins are imputed onto that other who is himself perfect and innocent of any sin. He suffers death in our place. Our guilt becomes his. He suffers. But he also purchases us in his suffering, in his death. So that we are no longer slaves to sin, but servants to the Redeemer, to Jesus Christ. You see, in his death, he bought us. He bought us and everything that is us and belongs to us belongs to Christ. And this is why the meat offering follows the burnt offering. We stand as a response to his salvation, covered in the righteousness and blood of Christ having been justified by faith alone for believing in his sacrifice. Now, now that we are justified, now that we are saved by Christ, and having been redeemed, can we offer anything to God? The meat offering then is the sacrifice of service, of sanctification, and the giving of ourselves and possessions to God in service to him. Why? Because Christ first redeemed us, saved us, 
Now we are able to serve him. And this is the gospel. One of the greatest faults of Cain's offering of his first fruits was that he did not begin with the burnt offering. He began with the grain offering. He brought his first fruits, meaning he was trying to approach God on his terms instead of first seeking atonement for his sins, as Abel had done. And how does that play out today? Each and every time you talk to somebody about the gospel and you ask them, why do you think you will enter into heaven? And when their response is, well, because I think I'm a good enough person, or I do good, I'm not that bad. I, you know, I think God is merciful and he'll, my good works will outweigh my bad works. That is a person offering the grain offering before the burnt offering. He is saying, I'm going to serve God on my terms. And I don't need that redemption of another. I will redeem myself by giving my best. And isn't that a saying among Americans? You can only do your best or give it your best. Well, in the eyes of God, your best are as filthy rags, and he does not accept them. You must first come in Christ. Brethren, we must recognize that the only way for us to stand before God acceptable is in Christ then will he find our good works acceptable to him. Because our good works are then sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So the meat offering is a sign of our sanctification. We are first justified, and then we are sanctified. We are set apart to service unto Christ. When you try to say, well, my good works, my good works, you're trying to say, I'm sanctified, therefore I will be justified. Doesn't work that way. You must first be justified. And that can only happen through Christ. Then can you be sanctified. And ultimately, the meat offering represents the perfect and finished work of Jesus Christ of his perfect obedience during his incarnation to redeem us. You see, in verse 1, it speaks about the fine flower. It is Christ who is this fine flower. It speaks of the oil. Christ, what does it mean? Literally means the anointed one. He has been anointed by the Holy Spirit. The oil also represents the Holy Spirit. He was set apart by God to do this great work. And does not oil represent a setting apart? That's what it means. To be anointed, to be the anointed one, to be the Christ means to be set apart. And, and we read it in the Old Testament, do we not? When a priest or a king were anointed, they were set apart to that office consecrated to serve God and to abandon the things of the world. In the New Testament, it is no longer the anointing of oil that men are set apart to service God. It is now the laying on of hands in ordination. And that's what the laying on of hands represents, a setting apart. The death of Christ was as his being burnt up to state that all the work and obedience of Christ was accepted by the Father, and his death was as a sweet aroma of frankincense to him. Ephesians 5, 2 says, says this. Paul wrote, 
Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Where does that language come from? Leviticus. You see, when the modern church says, oh, the Old Testament, we have nothing to do with the Old Testament, they might as well start erasing a lot of the New Testament too because Paul grabs his language from the Old Testament. The Old Testament still is for today. These laws may be done away, the sacrifices are done away, but the principles underlying these sacrifices continue till today. The meat offering not only points primarily to Christ, it also points to the church. For his body, the church, is presented to the Father and accepted because of Christ. This is why he claims ownership over us. And we are taught that on the last day, he will turn over all that, he, that is his to the Father. Everything he has redeemed will be given to the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says, Then comes the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. You see, at the last day, when Christ returns, and we are at the marriage supper of the Lamb after the judgment, Christ will give the kingdom to the Father. And like I said, the meat offering, the burnt offering, the peace offering, and all these offerings, we don't do them today. The temple is done, it's gone, it's destroyed, it's abrogated. The ceremonial law is abrogated. But the principles underlying them continue. They do. It's everywhere in the New Testament. Everywhere. Every one of you here who call on the name of the Lord have a requirement from God to live up to these principles that are found here in Leviticus. Because you see, every one of you must offer to God a memorial of all that you own to Him. Every single one of you who are Christians no longer offer a, um, um, uh, a bull, a calf, a pigeon, a grain offering. No. Your sacrifice that you're to offer to God every single day is yourselves. It's yourselves. Paul says, we are a living sacrifice, which must be holy and acceptable to God every day. Morning and evening must be a sweet aroma that comes from us to God. And you see, this is how we understand this language in the New Testament because of what we read here in Leviticus. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says this, I beseech you therefore, therefore brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do you hear what Paul is saying? You know, we don't have to go to a temple anymore. We don't have to prepare animals and all these things. And we may say, well, I'm glad that burden is gone. Well, guess what? Every single day, the sacrifice you are to prepare to God is you. You are to be that living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That is your duty. That is your duty, Christian. How are you living up to it? Yeah. Praise the Lord that it is in Christ who in our weakness is our strength. And again, this is why it is offensive to God to think that any human, any non-Christian 
can do this. Not a Muslim, not a Baha'i, not a Sikh, not a Hindu, not a Buddhist. None of them can present themselves as a living sacrifice to God, acceptable, holy, and a sweet, as a sweet aroma to him. None of them. Because they all deny Christ. They all deny his only begotten son. And you see, brethren, there is no more temple in Jerusalem. And if even if some people were to build it in the future, if that ever happens, it's still not going to be acceptable to God. He's going to reject that. Why? Because you are the temple. Every single one of you who are a Christian are a temple to the living God. And the Holy Spirit dwells in you. To build a temple in Jerusalem today will be an abomination to God. It will be a false religion to God. You are the temple. Paul again alludes to this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. The things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. That is what we are to be, a sweet aroma to the Lord, a sweet odor to him. And this is not to happen just on the Lord's day, the Christian Sabbath. This is to be every day. These sacrifices were done every day, morning and evening, morning and evening. So I ask you, brethren, examine yourselves. Are you living a holy life unto God? How is your walk before him? And so as you examine yourself, as you examine your walk before the Lord, confess where you are falling short. Confess it to Christ. Confess to him alone. Not to me, I'm not a priest. Thank God. I'm a pastor. You confess to Christ because he alone is the high priest. He alone is the mediator. You confess to Christ. And you seek forgiveness. You repent. And you strive to live a sanctified life, which the grain offering represents. And we need to reclaim these truths in our Christian life. You see, we are all called to live a sanctified and holy life in this world. All our service, all our possessions, even our own lives belong to God. And we must use all that we have and all who we are for his glory. And this is what that grain offering represents. To give to the Lord what he first gave us. Your talents, your gifts, you're to give them to the Lord. However small and few they may be. You may say, well, I don't have that many talents. You have at least one. Give it to the Lord. Don't bury it. There's a parable about that. Don't bury your talent, even if it's one. Use it, exercise it to the Lord. He will find it acceptable. We are also to give our tithes and offerings. They are but a portion of what is already his being offered back to him. This is what is meant by memorial in verse 2. It is a part for the whole to cause God to remember us, speaking anthropomorphically, that we are dedicating our all to him through a portion or a memorial which we offer, saying, by this little that I'm giving, I am confessing that everything belongs to you, however little. And we find this kind of language in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. Acts 10, verse 4, speaking to Cornelius, when he looked on him, he looked on the angel, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. Our prayers and our alms are a memorial before God. 
And that can only be when you're a Christian. They were like smoke from the altar as a frankincense represents our prayers. And the Lord looked favorably upon Cornelius. Brethren, your service to God is to give a portion of all your possessions as a memorial back to him day by day through your talents, your gifts, your time, your vocation. Whatever the Lord has called you to do, that is your vocation. You are to do it as unto the Lord. We are to offer to God each day ourselves to him. Now in verse 3 and in verse 10, it speaks about the priest was to take what remains for himself. And this is to teach the church, even today, that those who minister as Christ ordained ministers are set apart by ordination and are to live by the offerings given by the people of God. And is to teach the ministers of God that it is but a portion from all they serve in Christ that they are to live on and to depend on God for their sustenance. And we read this in the New Testament. All this language is in the New Testament. Paul says this in, verse, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? And he's speaking here that the minister lives the gospel. Part of your tithes and offerings are therefore also based upon the principle found here and the grain offering to maintain a minister of God who lives on the things of God and is part of one's Christian duty. And whatever little is offered, whatever amount, little or large, is offered, God calls most holy. Whatever you offer to God every single day, in your time, in your talents, in your vocation, God calls most holy. So wherever you're working at, Whatever you do, whether you're a housewife, a mother, someone who works outside of the home, all of that, you have to do it unto the Lord. Work unto him. Verses 4 through 7 breaks down the economic status of the offer. Because God wants all people whether rich or poor, to offer to him. And he takes into account everyone's status, everyone's economic status. Verse 4 speaks of more of the rich people, the ones who had ovens, and how they are to prepare the grain offering, to mingle it with olive oil, or to put oil on top of the wafers, like butter on top of toast. In ver verse 5 it, the utensil, utensil there is a griddle, something maybe a middle-class person would have back in that day. Again, you see the same ingredients, oil, flour, mingled. And verse 7 is what the poor would use. So what they would, the only thing they could afford to cook would be a skillet, a flat, simple pan for frying. But they're to use oil. Oil was in abundance back then. And here's the mercy and love of God. He accommodates to each one of us. He wants, he demands a sacrifice for every one of us, even this day. He accommodates to each one of us, given our social economic status. The very poor are taken into account so that they too can give even a little and bring forth a tribute to God in gratitude for all that he has done in saving them from their sin. And this is why Christ highlights the two mites of the widow. She gave more than the rich had done from their abundance. And the Lord praises her for her sacrifice. And the Lord teaches, when you give, you'll be blessed. When you go out there and you and you're serving another person, 
when you're serving your neighbor, when you're giving your time to another, the Lord will bless you. Brethren, we must remember our position in Christ. We must remember who we are in Christ and how he sees us. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20 tells us very clearly who we are in Christ. He says this, the apostle says this, Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Ye, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body and your soul belong to God, not to you, to God, first and foremost. And so you must glorify him in both body and soul. Yes, your body. You should take care of your body because it belongs to Christ. When Christ died on the cross, he died to save not just your soul, but your body as well. This is why in the resurrection, it will be both body and soul that is resurrected. And because we belong to him, we must live for him. We are to give ourselves to him. And this is why in Leviticus 2, there's a prohibition against leaven. There must be no leaven in a grain offering. And what is leaven in the New Testament? It represents corruption. It represents sin. It represents wickedness. We are to purge the leaven from our lives to live sanctified in Christ. What are we told? That we are to separate the chaff from the wheat, the leaven from the flour. And is that not the Christian walk? That is our duty day by day. And as we're coming to our communion season to come to the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, he speaks about this. We're to examine ourselves. We are to purge out the leaven in our lives, the chaff from our soul, so that we can come to the table worthily in Christ, cleansed by the Spirit. Brethren, this is what the grain offering represents to the Christian, to live a sanctified life, to live a life where we are ready and willing to give all to Christ. Because when they were giving but a memorial, it represented the whole. I'm giving a portion to you, Lord, in recognition that in reality, everything I owe belongs to you. In the last verses here, in verses 12 through 16, there are some other oblations that are given, some other sacrifices that are explained. In verse 12, we have the first fruits. As for the oblation of the first fruits, you shall offer them unto the Lord, but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. So there's a distinction here. There's a distinction here. And these first fruits, again, represent Christ glorified and raised up after his suffering. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 20, 23 tells us as much. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. You see, Christ is the first fruits. And because of that, we live. And we are to live as fruit. Children, how many of you like fruit? Nice, tasty fruit. None of us likes fruit when it's gone spoiled, right? But when it's juicy and sweet, 
And you see, we are to live as fruit to Christ. Verse 13 speaks of sacrifices seasoned with salt. Do we not see this image in the New Testament? What are we called to be, brothers and sisters? We are called to be the salt of the earth. Why? Because whereas leaven corrupts, salt preserves. Salt preserves. And here, verse 13, the salt is called the salt of the covenant. It's a preservative. It is something that causes or prevents things from going uh, corrupt or spoiled. Remember, they didn't have refrigerators back then. <coughs> Children back then, when Jesus lived, there was no refrigerators. Imagine that. Like for some of you that, that are here, you know, all you've known is the internet. Many of us remember a time before the internet. Same kind of thing. Salt preserves. Christian, this is our discipline that we are being taught here. We are to be the salt of the earth. We are to be fruit, the fruit of Christ. And then there's the oil. The oil which separates us. We are to put oil. There is to be frankincense. Our prayers are to be a sweet aroma to Christ. Then there's um, the sacrifice that speaks of the corn in verse 14. The green ears of corn dried by fire. Christ speaks of this in John chapter 12, verse 24. He says, Verily, verily, say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Speaking of Christ, he had to die so that he could be, he could be the first fruits that brings forth much fruit. And if you're in Christ, you are that fruit. Brethren, do not let go or miss the principle taught in the grain offering. When Christian leaders tell you that these sacrifices have nothing to do with the Christian today, they're mistaken. The principles that are underlining these laws, these sacrifices, very much apply to the Christian today. Very much so. And if you're in Christ, you're called to live a holy, sanctified life. And where you have failed, call to Christ. Seek his forgiveness. And he will forgive. And if you're not in Christ, there is nothing you can do to earn his favor. There is no amount of confession to a priest no amount of praying to saints or virgins, no amount of doing good works or following other prophets that can save you. No amount of awards by the people of the world can save you. You must look to Christ alone for your salvation. So if you're outside of Christ, I call you to repent and believe on him. For he stands ready to save. Then, and only then, as Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, yeah. do you become a workman, his workmanship, to do good works, which will be acceptable in his sight, because Christ and the Holy Spirit sanctify you. Let us stand as we close in prayer. <coughs> Our Lord and our God, we come before you in Christ to give you thanks for this preached word and a reminder that all that we are and all that we own belong to you, first and foremost. For you have bought us with a price. 
the precious blood that you shed on the cross. Lord, our God, we pray and ask that you will work a good work in all of us, that your spirit will move us to covenant with you, to recommit to you, to live day by day, morning and evening, a holy and acceptable life in you. May we continue to be the salt of the earth. And may we continue to preach forth the gospel of Christ to all people. This we do pray and ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.